Hello, and welcome to This Moment in Democracy. I'm Judge Travis Francis, and this is a special episode with the election nerds. My co-host today is Oliver Quinn, former assistant dean at Rutgers University Law School, Newark, and director of the school's acclaimed minority student program. Dean Quinn also serves as chairman of the Rutgers University Newark Advisory Board and is a trustee of the Center for Election Reform, creator of the Election Nerds. The Center for Election Reform is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the study of election reform issues. This podcast was recorded on July 24, 2023. Welcome to the second of a two-part edition with Ryan Haygood, civil rights lawyer and president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. Welcome back, Ryan. Great to be here, Judge. Thank you for having me for part two. We are continuing our conversation, and today we're going to examine in greater detail the Voting Rights Act and what you have called the crowning achievement of the civil rights movement. What, in your opinion, are the most serious challenges today to our election procedures and democracy in general? Yeah, so I, I love the question, Judge. You know, I think the you know, you know I think this really dovetails with the Center for Election Reform's work is this recognition that you know democracy always in this country has been a contested exercise. I think that's particularly true for Black people and other people of color. I think it's particularly true at this particular moment in our history. That is, that democracy has always been characterized, I think, by periods of expansion followed by efforts to scale back democracy. The election in our earlier conversation of Barack Obama was a high watermark for expanding democracy. And so, consistent with the theme of democracy in this country, you would expect as we experienced to see a a real um, aggressive effort to scale back democracy. And I think that was captured in the 2016 election up to this present moment. So one of the threats that we now see is consistent judge with the threat that we've always seen, which is there are really two ways to win an election. One way is to get more people out to vote. The other way is to stop people from voting. And we've seen particularly, I think, after the heart of the Voting Rights Act was struck, an intense assault on voting that was historic in its scope. The heart of it, you know, 10 years ago was um, was advanced by states through photo ID measures, but it's continued up through um, redistricting and gerrymandering districts to fence out some voters. Um, And I think these 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 assaults are really launched at the local level through city councils and school boards we're seeing that i think up to the state legislative and congressional levels so there is an adage that politics is local mm-hmm. as you know our listening audience includes students um, high school students hopefully uh, but certainly college and graduate students where can they make an impact locally and how So that's the promise, right? That's the promise. Now, I think that's always been the promise in our democracy, that the people really do hold the power and people wield power to do a number of things, including to hold elected officials accountable. And so in our first conversation, we talked a lot about Selma. I think that the Selma Bloody Sunday March is the guide that is how to harness power, that that when there have been moments advancements for justice, for racial justice, for social justice. They've always been inspired by a small group of people who've organized themselves very locally around an issue or a core set of issues that do advocacy in a way that gets the attention of the elective bodies in their cities and their states and ultimately up to Washington, D.C. But I don't think there's ever been a model where Washington, D.C. came down, like in Selma, without there being first an organized effort in those local communities. And so I think that's the promise. That has been what has really inspired our advocacy here at the Institute for Social Justice in the democracy space, you know, working with local communities across the state to think about 
how so whatever is happening nationally, right, the intense assault on voting, um, a lot of defensive posture to stop um, regressive voting measures. We have been inspired by a vision, an affirmative vision for how we might build in our state the most inclusive democracy. So if people are wondering, how do you do democracy? What does democracy look like? What is a democracy inclusion principle? We want people to think about New Jersey, given the work that we've done. And really quickly, Judge, when I came to the Institute, this iteration of it began by us organizing people across New Jersey to understand why it is that New Jersey had a law that didn't allow people on probation and parole to vote. And we did, we did some, you know, some deep research and writing, and we learned that in the year 1844, New Jersey did two things. One, it restricted voting to white men only. And in that same year, 1844, it denied the vote to people with criminal convictions. And so, Judge, we launched a campaign. It was a statewide campaign. It was powered by students, people in local communities, uh, regional voices, grassroots organizations, leaders of state-based organizations, and some really courageous elected officials, we launched a campaign called 1844 No More. And the goal was to turn a page on the year 1844 and to enfranchise people with criminal convictions on probation and parole. And really through some intense advocacy, we were successful in getting a bill passed at the very beginning of COVID, this would be March 2020, that enfranchised 83,000 people on probation and parole. As you, you know, that's nearly the size of our capital city of Trenton. But the reason I lead with that example is because that was advocacy powered by people in local communities, including people who themselves couldn't vote because of that, that bill. My colleague, Ron Pierce, for example, who spent 30 years in prison, came home and he was on, he was a life without parole person. He would never get his right to vote back. And he talked a lot about how voting has value to the soul and that it connects individuals to whole communities. And if we care about reintegration, if we care about keeping recidivism low, we have to give returning citizens a stake in their communities. What better to give them, he would say, than access to the lever that can change the conditions under which people live in the communities that he was returning to. So what were some of the arguments against passage of the bill? Mm. Yeah, fantastic question. You know, some of the arguments were punitive, you know, so they would they'd go something like you did the crime, you know, you do the time and part of the time means you lose access to the right to vote forever, I presume for forever. What was fascinating is the punitive nature of the argument. There was never enough punishment. Right. So, you you know, obviously part of the punishment, if, as you know, judge, if it's if it's prison, that means you can't move around. You, you're right. You have to go away for a while. There are a number of things you can't do associated with not being able to move around. But the right to vote, you know, is interesting because that would undermine the argument. Most people will return to their communities at some point after a sentence. And the question then becomes, how do they return? So one argument was was punitive. Another one was, you know, most states disqualify people with criminal convictions from voting. But another, I offer this really quick story, another sort of more insidious justification was this one. So we, in the course of our advocacy, met with a number of legislators seeking support for the bill. These legislators ultimately did not support the bill, though it was successful. And I was making this case for the bill, and I said, look, in Maine and Vermont, those two states never disqualify people with criminal convictions from voting. People even in prison still vote. Their constitution never took the right away. And I said, why don't we as New Jersey aspire to be more like Maine and Vermont? And there was a bit of silence. And one of the legislators, Judge, said back to me, well, the demographics there are different. Wow. And Oliver Quinn, I sat there for a moment. Right. Because you you had the wow moment. I sat there for a moment just to see if he would catch himself. And then I asked, how are the demographics relevant here? And he said to me, oh, no, you he said you baited me. 
you baited me. I said, no, I just asked you the question. As it turns out, Maine and Vermont are the two whitest states in the country at 94 and 95 percent white, respectively. But but ultimately, right, the demographics of a state shouldn't matter at all. They did. And they continue to. But rarely do you have a situation like that where the person is as transparent as he was. And he later tried to walk it back. But when the bill was before him on the assembly floor, he didn't he didn't vote for the bill. There we had a, we had a group of criminologists who wrote some testimony in support of the measure, who talked about how vote if we care about criminal justice reform, if we care about reintegration, if we care about reentry, voting actually helps to facilitate each of the legitimate aims of reentry, rehabilitation, restoration, and and the like. And and we've seen that to be to be true. You, you it was inspiring to see how many people who couldn't vote before. Mm-hmm the bill was passed, uh, mm-hmm. have exercised that vote since it was passed. And that and that judge really began, that was sort of the beginning of some of the reform we did in the democracy space um, in my time here at the Institute. Oliver? One of the wonderful things that the Institute does is puts out written reports, mm-hmm. compiles data, facts, which I know are the the value of facts seems to be under challenge these days, but the Institute provides facts. You've done reports on income inequality. You've done reports on housing segregation, on education segregation. What is the relationship between voting and these other areas that the Institute works in? I'm assuming that there is a connection between them, but how do the pillars tie together? You know, we think of them as, you know, and this may have been one of your early innovations, Oliver, as I was thinking about how we'd organize our work, but we think about the pillars as interconnected pillars, like so that voting impacts a range of things, including, you know, how your community is constructed, how responsive elected officials are, how much power do you have in your community, for example, to get, get connected to things like the prosperity uh, in, the, in, the, in New Jersey more broadly. You know, people are often struck by how wealthy New Jersey is. We're the second wealthiest state in the country, I think this year, only to Maryland. So our, in our state of New Jersey, resources, whatever folks ultimately say around budget time, resources are not, are not one of our bigger challenges. What is often as a challenge is, is our, our, how we prioritize distributing those resources. And so part of what voting does is it helps communities harness the power that they have to organize their voices, to realize that power so that they can see in economic justice opportunity to get connected to the wealth in their communities. So they can begin to think about how do we, you know, how do we address overwhelming student loan debt? You know, what kind of strategies can we advance to live in affordable housing or to own our houses and in the area of criminal justice. You know, to Oliver's point, you know, we spend a bunch of time doing research and writing in part because not the listeners to the center's program here, but folks outside of Eagleton, folks outside of Rutgers University system don't often appreciate the history of New Jersey and the role, for example, that slavery played in the shaping of New Jersey as a colony, that as a colony, New Jersey gave each English settling family 150 acres of land. And it also gave those same families an additional 150 acres for each enslaved black person who worked on that land. That was what shaped us at our founding. So when we talk about today's racial wealth gap, we have a $300,000 racial wealth gap. It's one of the largest in the country. Where does that come from? Well, that was actually created, that was conceived of during our founding as a colony. So to Oliver's question, our work is really focused on understanding the history of the modern day racial disparities we see, where they came from. Those, it's important to understand the history accurately and its enduring impact. But as important to Oliver's point, each of our reports sets forth a number of policy proposals designed to respond to the history we've described. And to empower people, we think about how information is knowledge, knowledge is power. People equipped with the information can then 
urge their policymakers, their legislators to pass policies and legislation to repair what we've seen. And so, you know, back to the, you know, restoring the right to vote to 83,000 people on probation and parole, the governor signed that bill in March of 2020 at the very beginning of the pandemic. So then came the question, so how do you register in a pandemic? You know, Oliver always asked me these very practical questions, including how many of the 83,000 people voted? Then the question was, how are any of the 83,000 people going to vote? In fact, how is any new registrant going to get registered in a pandemic? So then we worked with our partners to champion automatic um, voter registration and online voter registration. And this was all leading up to the 2020 election. And that was an election for a host of reasons, including who was on the ballot, but also because we made it easier through restoration of voting rights, through now online voter registration, 400,000 people uh, registered to vote online, and we had the highest turnout of any election in the history of the state in that election. So we've been thinking, like, how do we continue? We've got very low turnout in, say, school board elections, right? We haven't seen that high watermark since, but part of our affirmative vision for democracy is thinking about how we continue to build a democracy in New Jersey that does away with some of the impediments. So one, one quick thing, after online voter registration, we then championed a bill that ended what's called prison-based gerrymandering. It was a way of counting people in prison as residents of their prison community for purposes of, of, of um, representation in the state legislature, for purposes of apportioning government resources. Through our advocacy, we now count people in prison in their home communities that they ultimately return to so that their communities have the benefit of what follows from their representation. And then finally, more recently, we worked with partners to champion early voting in New Jersey. So we're seeing a trend through um, advocacy to get policy passed that begins to think about how New Jersey can be a standard bearer for an inclusive, robust democracy. Tell me what you mean by automatic registration. Great question. If you interact with a, a social service agency or a Department of Motor Vehicles, when you when you when you sign up for any any services or you go to get a license, you know you're automatically registered at those agencies. So it's a way to expand voter registration beyond the traditional uh, places where you get registered. And so here, there's there's typically an opt out provision, meaning you have if you want to get your driver's license renewed and you weren't registered you would automatically be registered unless you said, for some reason, I don't want to register. So we're thinking about, you know, like if you receive services from the state of New Jersey or your city, so you go to a social service agency, as you sign up for or get those services, you're automatically registered to vote. This is a way to think about how to provide democracy sort of unencumbered to as many people as we can who want to participate in our democracy. And really to your question, Oliver, you know, in our society, there are a couple of ways that individuals and communities can gain access to the levers of power. There's not one as, as rich as democracy, right? And ours, in, in, in a democracy, you affirm democracy by participating in it. Um, and so we talk a lot about how communities, one, people should know their elected officials at all levels. Two, they should have very clear asks of their elected officials and they should hold them accountable to advancing those asks. And, you know, sometimes folks have to run for those offices. You know, we don't do a lot of work at the Institute encouraging folks to run. We do more focus on people holding their elected officials accountable. But I do think that, you know, as democracies go, they're made most healthy by vigorous elections and, and, and vigorous debate. And more people running for office is a good thing, in my estimation. You know, accountability is a very interesting and clearly relevant issue um, in today's world. What are some of the Institute's accountability initiatives? Um, one, and two, and I know I'm inviting a long answer, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> two, we had spoken about some of the initiatives with respect to school boards uh, in terms of democratizing um, or spreading the democracy. Can you talk about that a little bit? You know, we have been 
when, when, when the media has talked about the S2, they talk about us as an honest broker, an independent thought leader. There was one article that talked about us as, you know, as being found with our fingers in the chest of power. I kind of like that. You know, I think of us as a critical friend to elected officials. That is, you know, with, with Governor Murphy, for example, we've stood with the governor on a range of things. We worked with partners to champion a $15 minimum wage. We worked with the governor to champion those voting rights reforms. We worked with the governor, his uh, attorney general, to get an independent prosecutor bill passed. You know, just two Fridays ago, we worked with partners to get up to a $25,000 down payment for first generation home buyers. So like really, I think things I'm very, very proud of having worked with the governor and the legislature to get accomplished. But, you know, Judge, we've also been clear that when elected officials, including the governor, need a critical friend, you know, someone to push them both privately and publicly, we would do that. And we would expend capital holding elected officials accountable. So we've used you know, in, inside we've used private conversations. We've also publicly called out elected officials. We've hosted rallies and convenings to ensure that elected officials both receive the high fives where they're appropriate from us, but also receive the strong push. Because I think one thing that New Jersey has taught me, you know, really versus my experience at LDF, at LDF, you know, to be honest, a number of, I would say most of my experience the adversaries are really clearly marked. They identified themselves as adversaries. It was like there was always a V, right? Person on the other side of the V was an adversary. In New Jersey, you know, politically, New Jersey, as you as you all know, you, you can look at the numbers. There are one million more Democrats than Republicans. So you think, well, shoot, if you if you cared about social justice and if Democrats are about social justice, this should be a layup with your dominant hand, right? But in fact, what you find is that in many ways, whether a person aligns with a political party or not, whether they think of themselves as a progressive or not, if they're not held accountable, they will default to the status quo. So they'll sound in a really progressive, forward thinking, uh, expansive terms. But if not held accountable, it'll just be words in a speech or on a paper. So part of our job at the Institute is to think about how we use, you know, Alan Lowenstein, our founder, you know, he considered whether we should be housed at Rutgers, for example, but he ultimately made the determination that we should be a standalone organization to preserve both our integrity and our independence. So we're not beholden to any particular party, any particular legislator or person but that we can focus like a laser on the issues. And I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of that we do that. So to your question, Judge, you asked about, so, you know, how do we wield the, the power? We've thought a lot about, we've done a lot of work at the state level. We've done work at the national level and in D.C. too more recently. But we've also started thinking about city councils and school boards as sources of power. And so this is, you know, and I'd love to get feedback, particularly from the students listening and, and adults with teenagers too. We started thinking about just sort of given what's happening with school boards across the country, thinking about like Florida and the attack on critical race theory and the attack on what uh, teachers can teach around foundational things like say slavery and its impact then and now. How might we do something in uh, our school boards in New Jersey to empower students to participate in the political process earlier. And so one of my colleagues, McCowry, did some research and found that New Jersey's constitution doesn't prohibit cities from lowering the voting age in school board elections. So we start thinking, what if we launched a campaign in a couple pilot cities that would lower the voting age to 16 for students in school board elections, given that that is most relevant to them. And ahead of lowering the voting age, this is Oliver's um, urging, that we build in, we stand with the superintendent of whichever pilot city and his, his or her principals, and we develop a civics curriculum that we get into the high schools ahead of the act of lowering the voting age 
to give them a sense of what civics is about, why voting matters. And instead of now, as we do, we go into schools and we do this, we say, and you can, armed with this information, you can vote in a couple of years. Now the conversation is armed with the civics information this, and the understanding of why voting matters and why it's precious and why we want you to do it. You can actually do it in the next school board election. And so I'm, I'm excited about this idea because I think it empowers young people who are already active, right? You see Darnella Frazier led one of the biggest social movements in American history following her recording of George Floyd, right? Um, but I think it also begins to answer the question, you know, Newark, for example, had 3% turnout in the last school board election, which is just, right, this is being, we're doing this virtually you know, audio, but if we could see people's faces right now, everybody's shaking their head. Like, how do you have a 3% turnout in any election, much less the school board election? I think one answer is, yes, we have to engage registered voters more. But another one is, why don't we explore bringing new, younger voters into the fold, given that school boards most directly impact them? You know, that's a project that is um, on the move. In other words, you're, you're still developing that project, correct? We are. So, and I think, so to your point, just, so very often city councils do a lot of constituent services, but they are a legislative body. So this measure gets passed in the city where the city council, a majority of it supports it. I would, I, you know, we're focusing on, we're doing some sort of preliminary work in cities to see where we might find a unanimous support because we we want it to be supported unanimously because it really would be an all hands on deck moment. And we want to be clear about centering would be 16 year old voters in in this because we're not 16. So we want them to really take ownership over this this opportunity. But I think there's a tremendous upside. But to your question, it is being developed as we as we speak here in, in July. Well, that was sort of a loaded question because I'm using that question as a preamble to get you back. Absolutely. <laughs> I love okay. it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. I need I need to come back to talk about that and more for sure. I was I was gonna ask the same strategy with regard to not just lowering the voting age, but tying that to civic literacy. Couldn't that also apply to people who are coming out of incarceration, who have been out of society for, for long periods of time, come out are where they're told that they can vote, they have challenges registering to vote, so they need support, but they also need information to help bring them up to date on the civics dimension of, of society. And, and I think that the Center for Election Reform, working with organizations like the Institute for Social Justice, can uh, collectively not just prepare materials, but disseminate materials and support people. So these things that are being enacted actually get implemented. Absolutely. Excellent. And let me just um, end with the reports that the Institute issues, uh, we would love to give um, those listeners who visit the Center for Election Reforms website the ability to um, link in to your website in order, the Institute's website, in order to uh, see those reports, uh, if that's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I would provide that. And I also would love for listeners to visit our website. It's www.njisj for New Jersey Institute for Social Justice.org. And you'll find the reports are really the heart of our advocacy, our desires to give folks who join us the information they need to make arguments and support the policy measure we're advocating for. So you'll find reports on our website. Thanks again, Ryan. Of course. Thanks for having me. And um, Oliver, uh, this was this was great, I think. Thank you. Today's podcast has been brought to you by the Eagleton Institute of Politics and the Center for Election Reform. Eagleton is a nonpartisan research unit of Rutgers University, New Brunswick. This moment in democracy was made possible in part by the generosity of Gerald and Kiko Harvey and Eagleton's many supporters. To support Eagleton's work or sign up for its newsletter, click the links in the description. 
to learn more about the Institute, visit eagleton.rutgers.edu and follow Eagleton on social media. Please visit the Center for Election Reform at www.centerforelectionreform.com to learn more about the election nerds and other podcasts. Thank you for listening.